okay, everyone. I'm going to talk about some of the large boring safety. Because uh, that's, that's what I want to discuss on my points. Uh, Dave calls the cover a lot on you know, operations. So, so, so I want to talk about the safety. Um, I've been uh, doing this uh, 37 years. Um, worked to start off with Mary Conkers. Uh, worked at Barco and uh, Neil Meyer Solder. There for a while, went to Robbins for seven years, did tunnel projects all over the world. Uh, I worked in India, Afghanistan, Australia, South America. So I've seen a lot of different things, but uh, never stayed long in one place to you know be an expert in just one place. You know, you guys a lot of your areas, you know those areas. So uh, I'm just gonna give you some pointers here and here we're out in the field, and but right now we'll talk about the safety. So um, we got a lot of these uh, <coughs> with these machines. I stress to everybody: make sure uh, whoever's machine you're using, make sure you read the, the owner's manuals uh, and, and know the capabilities of those machines. Um, it's, it's good to know that because uh, you might get a certain machine and think, "Okay, I got uh, plenty of power to do this." But I gauge my jobs on sixty percent of the power. Make sure. You're using that much or less. Um, if you're going to have to step up your machine, especially if you're doing rounds, you can get the bigger machines that are available to you to do that. Um, and, but know, know those machines because they're, they're very dangerous. Uh, I know too many people, I've known too many people have hurt or killed on these machines. So, uh, and a lot of it's been a human error. It's just, you know, it, it happens and you get in a hurry or so also Dave mentioned that too, like in a hurry and stuff. So um, uh, go through the safety rules in the, in the machine. Uh, there's, most majors have general safety statements. Um, I tell everybody too, if you can, uh, I don't know, the, the, the main size of the crew on an R4 is four to five people. That's why I think it's comfortable and safe. I've seen uh, and heard horror stories of two guys out on an R4. Nobody shows for um, guys in the machine. Uh, he's doing a steering job. Uh, the other guy's up on the surface, so he has to take the steering pressure. So he gets off the machine and it's running. And because you need the, the head to be turning to make a clearance for the steering job, like you got set up there. And he stumbles through this wall and falls into <coughs> a master pusher that doesn't have a door and takes his arm off the control. Comes back out, he picks it up, throws it up on the bank, climbs up the ladder, and passes it up. So, you know, it's, you, you gotta have the, the right crew, the right amount of people, everybody can be safe. And just little things like that that drive them nuts. Um, know all your stickers on the machines. Uh, we try to do uh, um, Spanish now too, so there's a lot of Spanish speaking people that work on these crews. And they don't, they can't read some of these decals, so we, we try to help out with that too. Um, yeah, it's just a very critical. There's a lot of pinch points on these machines. There's rotating augers. Uh, I'll play a video here. That's what we was trying to get set up at the end. And then I'll ask you all if you can point out all the bad things that they're doing. Uh, and you can, you can answer those questions. Um, yeah, no matter what, these machines uh, will flip. We do have tilts on our machines uh, that are supposed to de-clutch and shut it down. Uh, but we've got people set machines up diagonal in the pit because of the utilities in the area. And the machine would start to tilt and catch on the pit box. And it doesn't go all the way to shut it down. It wants to go a certain angle. So it's still sitting there running, leaning against it, and it starts kicking away from the wall. And it can still momentum break it over. So you still have to be cautious of what you're doing. Um, we do that uh, to try to get, we have a tether on the machines. Uh, we try all kinds of dead mans like, like an excavator, but uh, like a step. If you get off the step, uh, we had a detented and spring loaded that would spring up and shut off the arm. At least shut off the arm. Uh, so they just stack weights on it. So that's no good. Um, some of these uh, 
pictures of the affordable care. The safety devices. Um, the second one, that's a that's a pistol grip. So when, when you're pulling that trigger, that auger is spinning. When you let go of that trigger, the auger stops. So what do they do? They wire tie it. Now you can't stop the auger at all. Right? So try not to bypass safety switches. That's what they're there for to, to protect you and stuff. Um, the top one is the tether that's a, a hook to a belt or something. Uh, remember some machines, if you're on the left side, the machine will come towards you. So you have to jump to pull it. Some of this stuff that happens so quick. Um, but with the, the tilt sensor on, we put that on all machines at home. Um, even this small machine out here, we'll see it on there, I'll show everybody where it's at. And then we had to offer remotes. Um, all of our tier four machines come with remotes. And you don't have to use it. You can use it when you get in a split phase condition or something like that, or get into the front ground. You use that remote to get the operator out of that pit so he's not in, in a trapped environment. Um, and I thought it would be a bad thing because I'm an old, old guy that likes to feel it. And uh, the first machines we did with the remote was the cradle ball machine. And I don't know if everybody's familiar with those, they hang them from the side boom and the pipe line that I was using. And the operator was set up on top of the machine. And he's hanging 20 feet in the air sometimes. And those things can still float. I have a picture I found online. Uh, one of those cradle machines laying in the bottom of the, the, the trench with the D9 dozer on top of it. It pulled the D9 dozer in on top of this hole in the mirror. So they got some torque in them. So I'll put them on the Is everybody familiar with the boring machine? I uh, know the components. Um, I do this so everybody will get a copy of this too. Um, so you can know all this stuff. And there's names for it. You call up and order stuff uh, like the master pusher there. Um, everybody calls that a dirt box or something like that. So you kind of know your terminology uh, when you get into it. Everybody on the site will understand what you're looking for. So most all machines split down for safety. So you're, you're picking and lowering smaller picks. So you're not trying to lift a 25,000 pound machine down a 30 foot shaft. You can take sections down. So it's a little bit easier to work with. And that's all the components I use and stuff. Again, I, I stress on the manuals. Um, it doesn't matter if you got, you know, two years or 20 years. Uh, every machine's got a little bit of difference in, in specs and stuff. So just be aware of it. Know your range of your machines too. I trained a guy, um, he had 15 years on his belt, and uh, he left the head on, and he the seat, and left the wing cutters on, and was killed. Uh, and she flipped and smashed him twice on the ground. And this is before we did the tilts and stuff. And uh, it, I just hate to see that stuff, it doesn't have to happen. Um, and in that case, he probably should have had some kind of uh, hammer tool. We have a, a customer up in Canada now. When they, when they clean out the case, they put a hammer on the front and they use our airway augers and pump air. And it breaks up everything that's wedged inside and then they clean them out. I'm going to tell people if you have to do this, just do uh, 10 foot at a time. Don't put a whole 20 foot stick of auger and try to bring in that case. Because you got a floppy joint out there that's outside of the case. Just do 10 foot at a time. So you're a little more stable. Make sure that machine is all hooked into the track and you're using the dogs. Um, the video I'm showing earlier, you'll see what I mean by using the dogs. This machine is at least locked to the track. Uh, and uh, some people not do it. They try to use those uh, wheel drives and stuff like that. <coughs> Keep the maintenance up on the machines, um, especially the greasing and stuff. We use the maintenance manual. And section in the manual that I think you have up to date on. Some things are daily, uh, some are you know weekly. Now uh, that's what I talked about with the master pusher and the spoil shoot door. Um, that gets ripped off or broken off. You can get another a lot 
times they don't mess with it, just leave it alone. Because sometimes when you're in clays, you have to at least open the door and we got it so it's a two-way door. Because the clays are filled up there and uh, it's hard to get them out without taking a shovel and help them out. But uh, if, it, if you still don't have the door there, so you, you can close it halfway or what, so you, somebody can't fall. Or at least you start to be very careful with shovels, so don't stand right in front. Get hit by that door when a rock or something hits it and flops up. And, uh, so you got to be cautious. That's so always staying off this side. These long handle shovels. Don't be Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Talk about the guy in Texas that tried to climb on the top of the case. That was, that was the second guy. Uh, he was actually, if I'm not mistaken, he was a foreman on the crew. And he climbed over that. And there was no door, and he got sucked into that barrel. His whole body went into that room. So you can imagine that it's just horrendous. Um, yeah, don't be climbing over stuff. I mean, walk around it. Uh, I, I've been guilty of going over the casing. I would never climb over a master pusher. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's scary. And this thing's traveling out here. You don't know what year it's in. It doesn't matter what year it's still going to pull you down. Uh, never set your ladders up close to where that, that barrel is uh, when you do your pit set up. I had a guy come down the ladder and he slipped and his foot went in and they were sitting there just trying to line up the hex and they had it reversed. And he grabbed his foot and pulled him in right to his crotch and the operator stopped him just in time. But he had to put it back in first gear to get him out. And, and when they got him out, he lost three toes. But uh, this, this was in Maryland, and Maryland OSHA just went nuts on this, on this job. They, they shut it down and everything just because of it. But the ladder dug, shouldn't have been set there, it should have been at the very back of the away from the rotating parts of the And the hook rollers are very important because uh, if you do pull your dogs in and you forgot to turn your armor off, the machine's still locked in the track. So utilize that stuff, it's there for a reason. Use it, uh, make sure it's latched in, uh, and latch both sides. Some latch only at the one side, thinking it's only going to flip one way. Uh, you can flip either way, but you can put it in reverse and do it another way. And reverse it first are the strongest gears. They're slow, but they're strong, they won't hesitate to do the same thing just as fast. It's so one second that you can flip that machine. And then I just put on here some checklists. I, I tell everybody too, um, with the crew size, you have a toolbox meeting in the morning when you start the crew, sometimes at lunchtime too, and make everybody responsible for uh, noticing the stuff on the job sites that doesn't look right. Maybe you see a little collapse around your pit box or something like that. The people should bring that to the foreman's attention and say, hey, you may need to fix this or something. Um, uh, you see something that's broke on a machine or something, bring it to somebody's attention. Just pay attention to all that. But uh, use this checklist to go through and, and have that, that talk with everybody in the morning or in the afternoon. Uh, I know some people do it twice a day at least, and uh, if something could happen midday, just don't know. And you don't want anybody to be quiet about it. And someone would be afraid to say something if they're going to lose their job. You know, just say something. Don't be afraid to say anything. And then we just put in here some of the standards or recommended pit sizes. This is old machines. When you get into the tier four stuff, it's all new setup. Machines got wider, some of them got taller, and they got longer because of the depth systems and just uh, so crazy on like the, the EPA stuff. It's ridiculous. Don't get me started on that. And I think one of the things that with that on the height that you got to watch that a lot of times we don't think about, we forget, is those spreader height. Is the guy standing on the side of that machine, so is he going to be able to safely cross underneath that spreader as it goes underneath and still operate it safely, or do you have to put in arch spreaders or something like that? I've, I've seen people down like this with their arm up over the rack, like trying to run. You can still take your arm off that machine lifts up. I'm afraid your arm right off, smash it. So, just be cautious of that. Uh, I see a lot more um, side support in you know, the pits now with the, the 
embrace them. I don't know if you've seen them. You guys absolutely did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or even arch spreaders. Uh, so they're they're much higher. Uh, so you, you can almost flip the machine and nothing would happen in here. It's not going to touch anything. But not to get money, you don't want to flip the machine. So. points out uh, setting up track. A lot of the track now is getting even better than the older stuff uh, where we've uh, advanced it using guide pins and stuff to help line things up. Uh, like our tri bore has uh, guide pins in it and a, a dome that goes on the inside of the plate, the plate that helps pull everything together so you're not simply trying to shim and do all this. You just pull everything up and it sucks it all together. Like the tribal machine, but actually the tractor you want to It's not a one, two, three, four line of like this old stuff. But yeah, you have one match one, two match two, because they're all custom lined up in the shop. Um, so that's not like it. Plus, our R36 machine and 48 machine all use the same track. The only thing that changes then is the center line. So if, if you uh, had extra track, then you can do 40 foot 20, you can use it from the 48 machine. Awesome, it's tier four. Um, and all of it, like I mentioned earlier, all the track is uh, basically a foot wider than what it was when it was tier three. It's already got wider, the stance is better. It does cause you to big, build bigger pits though. So that's probably the bigger downfall. It's a uh, more big. Yeah, I feel we'll talk about a lot of this stuff. It's, it's easier to get out there to talk, uh, to show it. Plus, like pit stuff and everything. Uh, Chad and I will be talking about pit safety. Uh, they do shoring and all that. So, uh, you'll get a lot of good information from them on that. Uh, we do have a pit night pump out here, too, uh, just for show. And then, uh, Josh from Barrowway will do some blood sampling and stuff. And, uh, you'll see when we get out there. We'll talk about that when we're out there.
so you speed it up or whatever. But with this, you just add more cutting banks, and now the cutting banks don't have to travel so far to do all the work, and they reduce some of the torque. And I think it creates more torque, but it does try to reduce it. Um, and in uh, knowing the right head, too, like uh, roller cutting heads or disc cutting heads, do not like the soft soils. Um, I used to run the tunnel machines, the motorized SPU and stuff with. Uh, Basically, about 40 30,000 foot pounds of torque is their max torque. And then I was doing solid rock up to 40,000 psi rock. No problem. But when I hit soft ground, it would stop the <coughs> because the soft ground requires more torque to, to get that soil out. And with those discard heads, you just, just couldn't do something like that. Um, but discard heads, you don't have the ability to switch it out. Uh, roller cones, uh, we have a collapsible roller cone. So while you're doing some rock, uh, and you encounter something, you can pull that head out and it collapse, pull out, and then switch it to a dirty head or something. And go in. Unless it's a split face, then that means uh, you've got to go through the possible hands on them to jack that rock out with a jackhammer you know, to get through that area. Um, so, like Dave said, you have a 20 point blow. I, I tell people 36 uh, is probably the smallest, the safest you can get into now, but you can get into it's, it's just, you got to have the ventilation, you got to have all that stuff, and have room to work in that case of high buildings. I try to get people to the upsize that they can, the engineering ability to restrict that sometimes. I have a bigger case of to have those backup plans to get in there and do that. That's just the continuous of different hills. Did you talk about with the roller cones, hey, a lot of times you have enough water? Oh, the roller cones require tons of water. This kind of is uh, the roller cones, uh, they have one bearing on them. They create friction because they're pulverizing the rock. Um, so they will build up friction, they will get hot. And if you're not putting water through an airway auger or water auger to get the water right to the head, uh, you may even put water lines around the outside and put multiples because you're going to lose one. Uh, you're going to crush it or whatever. Stop the water, so I put two or three of them on there, three eighths or half inch. And if you're not with that, you might not get water to the dry cone in the center because it sticks out farther. So that one's going to get hot. <coughs> I, I recommend with a collapsible, um, if you pull it out, you know, every 20 or every 40, pull the plugs, re grease it, to tighten your cutters back up, you're going you're gonna to get more light out of that cutter. Um, we had a guy to over a thousand feet with one better head because he greased it quite often. Um, he did have water on it, but he was afraid of getting enough water to put it. The water does help <coughs> if you want to put your water lines on and all that. How much water are you referring to? A gallon? Probably, I'd probably say 100 gallons. Uh, a minute would do it. Um, so you got to the Say a two inch pump would probably be enough to you know, keep it cool. It depends on what volume you're using, too. So you got a lot of volume here to fill up and move. So you may have to go to three or four inch just to get enough water over there. Because uh, you're filling up water tubes. The, the water pointing through the hex is a, a two or three inch hole that goes through the center of the hex. And then we have two different attachments. We have a countersink hole that goes through the bushing, threads into the bushing has a nut that goes into the, the chain. Or we have the, the, the split pin connection. So you're not going through the center, you're going through the sides of your bushings. And we've done up to seven inch airway heads uh, for that up at the end. Yeah. Our auger tube is 12 inch diameter, one inch wall. The other thing we've done is we have a pilot first, and then yeah. use the pilot then then the from the other side. Yes. Pump it back to us yes. right. to keep it cool. Because the other way we've done that. And, and, and at that point, you don't have your center cutter in there because you've already cut the pile. So now you're just watering the rest of the heads. And that's great because I'm texting something. I don't know if you've got it. Yeah, we don't know. Jetty water pressure. Yeah. 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 It's coming out of the green. Oh, yeah. And we, we do a flex tool that we use for water pumps on, of course, that. And that's how that's done because everything's pumped through. We use air as water to 
forces flow through that cutter head, through a drive, or through a, a spoil casing inside the product or the drive casing. So, <coughs> you're just setting your cutting loss and your spoil is being pumped out to a dirt box or a recovery area. And not using any poggers, and some are just using air and water, it's usually not contaminated. So, you know, you put that right back and say, a lot of places. Two, three years ago in Pennsylvania, we were um, doing a lot of gas lines and, and stuff over there, and they were fracking out the rivers and such materials. At one point, everything was shut down except for the driveway work or the reflex work. The job center was were still running because it wasn't using mud and stuff, it was just using air and water. So they kept everything running. It was just kind of a cool thing to keep it on the they still got in trouble one time when they cracked out and they come through the air. They just loosened the bottles of the water. Yes. Oh, no. It's right. I'll ask him the thing. John. Hey, you guys do a lot of drilling and drilling? Yeah, we yeah, run about three years. 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 We have uh, the, the roller cones we have that are fixed and then we have the collapsible. Um, and then the one on the bottom left there, that's a, a PVC cutter head. Um, that was a 36 inch. It did 240 feet of 15,000 PSI rock. And it has wing cutters on it. And it's that diamond crusted carpet. Um, we won't build them that big anymore um, just because of the torque requirement. Um, we spec'd out 60 head one time, and they told us we needed 375,000 foot pounds of torque. And I 
I, I tell everybody we put uh, half inch space for the loggers so they don't have too much room to spike. Now, we'll still get tight in the case if you use uh, problems, but we don't necessarily blow the auger. Um, so when you step augers, and a lot of people step augers, and I, I don't have a problem when you step one size. If you start going down too far, you just got to be cautious. If you hit an interrupted cut or something, you're getting those torque spikes. And it doesn't always happen, but that auger can expand even more because it has more room to expand. So that's just be cautious of all that. And it's not any fun when you blow an auger too bad. you got to crawl up in there and pull it out, get it out, out. And, and I was going to mention too, when you're when you're retracting augers, when you finish the war, try to get the head off. Um, take it off so it's out of there. And for any reason you're cleaning the casing and you're coming back and you want to, you know, spin it. If you don't have the head on in there, then you open and you catch and flip the machine. Uh, cause it, cause it. So take the head off. Uh, if you're stepping augers, be cautious that you got a layer of spoil in there. Uh, say you're halfway on the water. And you don't have a layer of spoil that builds up on your smaller augers. Uh, what's going to happen when you try to pull all that out? You can't get it all this. You're going to have to spin it in reverse to get it back through that. So now you get it out, you don't put everything back in because you retooled your head or whatever. So what do you do with that spoil? Well, don't put your head back in. You're going to have to clean that out first, but you're free boring. That's when everybody flips their machines. You have to be very cautious. Uh, I don't recommend doing that. Have to, you have to get it cleaned up. Get it cleaned up, pull your augers back out, put your head back on, and push it back in. And you'll see in this video, um, you'll just see a lot of things in here, and I want everybody watching and ask you what you see.
I, and I will caution and I will say that you can have the best crews and the best guys in the world, and yeah. somebody will get an airbrained idea to be stupid. I had a guy turn around and weld a nut on the inside because he wanted to use the augers to be able to pull him in. And it caught, it put the machine in, broke his leg. You know, I mean, it was told, don't do this. I mean, these are guys who've been beaten into about safety. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But they still sometimes will think production, 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 and they'll take a shortcut. And, and I mean, I've had, had a machine flip from a guy doing that. I had a machine flip from an inexperienced operator trying to learn threading augers. It caught, it flipped the machine, started to flip the machine. He went to pull it out of gear. Somebody had made a field modification to the clutch handle, and it broke off in the guy's hand as he went to pull it and to engage the clutch. And he luckily was able to jump free and grab a hold of the ladder. And I was there when it happened. I was standing off, and all of a sudden, I hear the big boom. Machines hit the side of the trench box. Pieces of damn PVC pipe come flying out of the hole because he had to put it in water. And, you know, it was just like, what the hell were you thinking? I mean, you, you try and teach them, you try and go through all this stuff. And, and they've got to respect it, that there's a lot of dangerous stuff here with this stuff. And you will have people that you just got to continually try and reinforce that. I mean, it, it's a constant reinforcement of safety. Yeah, that's why I, I like to, to see the toolboxes more, toolbox talks. And just keep these people, you know, make sure they know. Just don't walk around the machine that's exposed like this. I mean, that's, that's so dangerous. Um, yeah, like Dave said, I've uh, seen it happen. Uh, I talked to guys about Corpus Christi. He had an old Richmond machine. Um, he put a seat on top of it. None of his bits were like more than six feet deep. It was just a small machine, but he put a seat on top of it. He said, why do you do that? The manufacturer doesn't recommend that. He said, well, I did, so I can jump off of it when it catches and flips. <laughs> and he said he watched that thing flip 18 times one time before it broke something and stopped turning a little bit. But, but in, in this machine, it's uh, 2,500 pounds, but it has over 30,000 foot pounds of torque. Yeah, I mean, when our machine flipped, I mean, it, the guy tried to pull it out of gear, it came off. There was nothing you could do. You had to wait till the fuel ran away, yeah. and it no longer was able to get any fuel that starved itself, and that's when it died. Yeah. Until that time, it's just going to keep beasting the game, just going to keep bouncing. And so if somebody's trapped underneath that, there ain't nothing they might do. I, I mean, I. I I've been around this industry long enough, and there's a lot of people that have been around the industry a lot longer than me. And almost every one of these old hats that have been around have a story of being bucked oh, yeah. off the machine. One guy I know got thrown off into, luckily they had shot rock, and shot it big enough, he fell back into the rock, cut, and it just hit him in the chest. He gave him bad bruises, but didn't kill him. It wouldn't crush him. He just got lucky where he got thrown off it. I mean, these are guys that have been doing this for 30 years. Yeah. I mean, they just, every one of these guys that have been doing this 30, 40 years has seen this stuff happen. So, no matter what you do, it, somebody's going to do something stupid. You can't always control it, so you got to do the best you can. Even those who set up your pit, set up your machine in the pit and everything. Uh, overseas, I've done a couple of jobs where they've killed people on sites. And it's from uh, six guys telling a crane operator what to do. And they pick a machine up and a guy's standing by the wall and you hear the crane's over by him, not over the machine, and smash the guy in the wall. It's just, but in some of these countries, that's just an expendable person. You know, they didn't, didn't bother, they weren't even excited about it. You know, I was like, man, that's, that's a terrible thing to happen. Oh, look there, right? you know, we'll just move on. So uh, I've seen some terrible things overseas, and some of them just don't. And that's why these guys have done a great job with a lot of the new technology, a lot of manufacturers with the tilt systems, with, with all that stuff. The problem is, is that a lot of times you're going to go out and you're going to find an old machine that maybe doesn't have all that. And, and so you may have people that are even used to running a new machine. You find a good deal from Chad over here on the corner machine. There's an older one that somebody's getting rid of. Well, that's great, but you need to understand, maybe it doesn't always have all the same safety stuff on it that a brand new machine has. And you can call us and we, some of the, the tier three that are like 2,000 and newer, we can uh, retrofit some of that stuff. We can put some of that stuff on it. As long as you have electric valves or where you can just do the fact you've got to buy new valves and put them on so they have that capability. Uh, so some stuff can be retrofitted. So it's not like it can be made safe. When you get the old stuff, Questions? Um, is 
there's a lot to go over when we get on the field too. So we'll I think one thing we didn't, I didn't touch on and is your setup, how critical that is. Your setup is one of the most important things that you got, right? And there's several different ways that people set their base up. Some will pour concrete pad, some will use plates, some will use just, you know, we use deck boards and mud seals. Ours go differently than a lot of people do, just the way we set up one of our pictures. You saw the guys running boards at the bottom, those are our mud seals. And, and so people just run them differently for the base setup. But you also got to know your soil conditions, that's what you're trying to set it up on from the vibrations and everything. Is it going to settle? Is it going to whatever? Because the biggest problem you start running into is if you do start getting off line and grade, when you go to make that connection with the next piece of pipe, it won't necessarily line up. It won't line up with your master pusher. It won't line up a bunch of different ways once you weld on it, right? Because you don't weld it back to where the machine set. You weld that pipe based off where that pipe's going. You want that pipe straight. You don't want to weld dog legs into it all automatically. You'll make it harder for control of line and grade. So that initial setup and staying on line and grade throughout the whole crossing is very critical. Because if you get off, you're going to create all kinds of problems, and that's when people start fabbing stuff to make it work, grabbing a hold of the casing, pulling it over, and putting it in a bind to get it into the master push, all that stuff. I, I've met a lot of people too, older stuff, that they would, uh, they know they've got to hit a point here, they would take the machine and they know it's going to go to the right, get an angle to the left, so they would steer and hit the point they want to hit. That's, don't do that. It's not but when you start curving the board, anyways, you, you start creating more thrust pressures and torques on the on the auger. Um, Mark Bed machine back in '94 did 800 BV, the 36 inch. Um, they were often great by two tens, but they were they were high. It was still usable. It was 36. They had four inch heads and never broke the heads, but they went 17 feet to the right. So that's that's a gradual bend, but it's still a lot, uh, but it tells you how much slop is in the augers and stuff. But even going around the curve like that, you're going to build up some torques, you're going to rub your augers, uh, it's, it's just going to wear stuff prematurely. So it's best to keep everything on the line and grade as much as possible. So it's critical to measure your lead piece of auger, to use the tightest piece of auger up front to keep everything centered and tight. Uh, so because those augers will wear down over time. I mean, we, you end up buying 42, and after a few years, you'll make them down into 36s because you wore them down so much, you just cut them down. Um, so you, you definitely have to measure your augers, measure your casing, make sure everything that you're getting is set right. Any questions? Okay, I think uh, Tim is next. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott.